In 2008, the skull of a large ocean dweller was found high in a Peruvian desert. Embedded in the massive skull, which measured about three meters long, were teeth that seemed to belong to a relative of the modern sperm whale. But there was something different about them. For starters, they were bigger, much bigger. Some were up to 36 centimeters long, so they clearly came from a gigantic predator, bigger than any whale so far discovered. The creature was so evocative of monstrous mythical whales that scientists eventually named it Leviathan Melvilli, after the biblical sea monster and the author of Moby Dick. English major, yo. I got that reference right away. But unlike in fiction, giant whales don't emerge fully formed from the ocean deep. So where did Leviathan come from? How did such a large predator live? And what caused the titan to die out? Tracing the rise and fall of Leviathan reveals a sea monster so hungry it might have eaten itself to extinction. About 25 million years ago, in the late Oligocene Epoch, a group of whales originated known as Physeteroidea. At first glance, they were indistinguishable from other toothed whales at the time, meaning those with teeth rather than the long, fibrous baleen found in filter feeders like blue whales. One of the earliest members of the Physeteroids was Ferrocetotherium, which lived in a shallow sea between what's now the Black and Caspian Seas. But one way that Ferrocetotherium and its descendants were unique was a large, strange organ atop their heads. Filled with literal tons of a waxy substance called spermaceti, this organ's exact function is still debated by scientists. Two common hypotheses are that it assists with vocalization and echolocation, or it may help these whales dive deeper. See, spermaceti has a low melting point, so when the whale is resting, it's a liquid. But with just a few degrees drop in temperature, it turns to a solid and helps whales sink. These sperm whales were part of a larger family of toothed whales called the odonocetes, which was diversifying widely since appearing around 38 million years ago. Also getting more diverse were the baleen whales. Both groups were generally modestly sized by, I don't know, whale standards, with ferrocetotherium measuring about five meters long. But by about 13 million years ago, in the early Miocene epoch, sperm whales appeared around the world, with genera like Brigmophyceter and later with Zygophyceter. And while these new whales had the spermaceti organ too, they differed from earlier ancestors like Ferrocetotherium in that they had huge teeth. And yes, all whale teeth are pretty massive, but these teeth were also proportionally huge, measuring up to 20 centimeters long and over five centimeters wide for Zygophyceter. Thanks to their giant teeth, scientists refer to this group of sperm whales as macroraptorial whales. That is great branding. And researchers think that they fed using the grip and shear method, grabbing onto prey and ripping off a chunk of flesh, which allowed them to consume large prey relative to their body size. One group of scientists has suggested that these giant bites were so intense that they produced bony outgrowths on the inside of the whale's mouths to help buttress against the intense bite forces. Now, these macroraptorial feeders weren't alone in the waters. Other sperm whales evolved at the same time who, curiously, completely lacked an upper set of teeth. Rather than shearing flesh, these whales used their lack of upper teeth to trap prey like squid before suctioning them up whole, known as suction feeding. But it was a macroraptorial grip and shear feeding strategy that seemed to be most successful at the time, because over the next few million years, the macroraptorial group started getting larger. And around 10 million years ago, the almost 18 meter long Leviathan emerged, lording over the world's oceans, which were filled with everything from miniature baleen whales to aquatic giant sloths. Leviathan was truly a master of its domain. With a skull longer than an average human, evolution had produced the biggest toothed, most hypercarnivorous whale ever known. But with all that bulk to support, what did such a giant whale eat? <laughs> Say it with me, whatever it wanted, of course. And here's where the diversity of whales at this time comes in. During this period, there were tons of different filter-feeding baleen whales as well. These were not the massive whales we know today. Instead of 30-meter-long giants, these smaller ancient filter-feeders, like Pelocetus, often measured just a fraction of that, around 12 meters long, a size that would have made them excellent prey for Leviathan, which almost certainly ate both baleen filter-feeding whales and their own toothed whale relatives. Also included in Leviathan's diet? Um, pretty much everything. Sharks, seals, fishes, you name it. Although paleontologists have yet to find direct evidence of predation by Leviathan on other animals, like bite marks, they see evidence that Leviathan's jaws experienced especially intense bite forces through that additional bone growth around the teeth. So given this impressive size and feeding strategy, Leviathan must have been the dominant predator of the water 10 million years ago, right? Well, not quite. During the late Miocene, there existed not only the giant predatory Leviathan, but also the most famous of sharks, Otodus megalodon. Estimated to be around 20 meters long and with teeth the size of your hands, Megalodon was more than equal to Leviathan as far as biting went. 
The existence of both giants demonstrates that there was such an abundance of prey, both predators could be supported. And while there's no direct evidence of interactions between Megalodon and Leviathan, their comparable size and likely similar prey selection means the two titans certainly encountered each other. Yet this enormous mash of monsters wouldn't last. When we look around the world today, we might notice a conspicuous lack of giant sharks and sperm whales. So what happened to them all? The exact details about how Leviathan went extinct are still unclear. What is known is that, beginning around 5 million years ago and lasting until just 10,000 years ago, the world experienced a substantial uptick in the extinction rate of marine megafauna, one that peaked between 3.8 and 2.4 million years ago. Some scientists suggest that this die-off might be related to dramatically changing sea levels at the end of the Pliocene due to growing glaciers in the northern hemisphere. With so much more of Earth's water frozen in polar ice caps, what had formerly been productive shallow coastal habitats became dry land. And the drying out of coastal habitats not only eliminated physical space for marine life, it also deprived marine ecosystems of a great deal of nutrients. It's possible that given the high caloric requirements of a super predator like Leviathan, any change in ecosystem productivity could be especially devastating. Given the cost of fueling its massive body, any disruption to even the smaller whale's population could have caused it to die out. Some researchers, however, advise caution in interpreting this die-off event. Because marine fossils from coastal areas are preserved and collected at higher rates, so it might make evolutionary patterns observed in coastal areas overrepresented in our interpretation of the marine fossil record. But if a lot of their prey was becoming less abundant, such big, hungry hypercarnivores would have been extra vulnerable. And while there's a range of hypotheses surrounding the giant's extinction, some researchers have suggested that Leviathan's own success may have contributed to its downfall. Leviathan, together with Megalodon and other super predators that swam the Miocene oceans, put enormous pressure on their main prey animals, the medium-sized baleen whales. Some scientists suggest that this could have spurred the evolution of increasingly large baleen whales, potentially leading to the giants we know today. As baleen whales increased in size and smaller coastal forms died out, there were likely fewer and fewer snack-sized whales for Leviathan. And while the fossil record is a fickle thing and it's hard to tell when the last of the species disappeared, Leviathan and its kin definitely vanished by the Pliocene Epoch about 5 million years ago. Megs held on just a little longer until about 3.6 million years ago. The extinction of the macroraptorial sperm whales was followed by the rapid diversification of modern dolphins and orcas, who seemingly evolved to take over at least part of their evolutionary niche. So the extinction of Leviathan and Megalodon left a permanent mark on ocean food chains. And all that's left of a once vastly diverse group are the three modern sperm whale species around today. These whales, like the most common species alive today, Physeter microcephalus, do share the spermaceti organ with their ancestors. But their feeding habits are different from the massive macroraptorial sperm whales that once ruled the ocean. In a twist of fate, this group once differed the most from the rest, the suction feeders. As Leviathan and the rest of the macroraptorial sperm whales passed into the fossil record, it was the suction feeders that went on to become the stuff of myth and literature, reminding us that being a massively sized predator can be an advantage until it isn't. And being such a hungry sea monster can ultimately lead to species downfall. All throughout Earth Month, PBS is releasing new episodes celebrating our amazing planet. And we wanted to tell you about a new episode of Overview about a modern day Pompeii. They tell the story of a series of volcanic eruptions in the 1990s that froze in time the Caribbean city of Plymouth, Montserrat. Links to that episode and the full Earth Month playlist are in the description. <laughs> well, I guess we can partially thank a cooling climate for not having to deal with Leviathan and Megalodon. Could you imagine? But how have we humans dealt with dropping temperatures, even fairly recent ones? Check out our episode, How to Survive the Little Ice Age, to learn more about a roughly 450-year-old village in southwest Alaska that thrived during this time. And we gotta thank this month's macro-eontologists. Eddie, Annie and Eric Higgins, Carl Wolfel, Jackie Scott Ralston, Jake Hart, John Davison Ng, Juan M., Melanie Lamb Carnivale, Nico Robin, Raphael Hassa, and Steve. By becoming an Ionite at patreon.com slash eons, you can get fun perks like access to behind the scenes content, including clips from Eon shoots. You can see me horsing around. And as always, thanks for joining me in the Ken Barnes studio. Subscribe at youtube.com slash eons for more adventures in Cenozoic creatures. Tracing the rise and fall of Leviathan reveals a sea monster so hungry, 
it might have eaten itself to extinction. That's me after leg day. The number of times I say sperm in this script, I'm, just, I'm glad I don't moderate the comments anymore.